Celia was 35 years old, valued at $1,000. That's your great, great grandmother's ceiling. And right below ceiling are the hogs, the cows, Calves, heifers, ox, and the sheep. I know that uh, being uh, uh, a lifelong, lifelong meaning lifelong Mississippian, that uh, we were slaves. Mm -hmm. um, that is my history. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't have, really don't have a problem with it at all mm -hmm. because that was then, this is now. Bill, a boy, $450. That is your great-grandfather, William McAlpine. $450 for somebody's life. And that's his value as a boy mm -hmm. when he was a slave. A value. Bill, a boy. Bill, a human being. <laughs> but on that day, he was a piece of property. Absolutely. To be bought and sold. The names of the slaves are powerful memorials in their own right. But they are also much, much more. Names give an individual an identity. And finding these names can bring family history back to life in unexpected ways. Most of us assume that slavery destroyed the black family. But records prove that the laws that attempted to keep the slaves from marrying couldn't always prevent them from forging the most intimate and stable relationships. We found Tom Joyner's third great grandparents, Tony and Clara, listed as the slaves of a man named Obadiah Dumas. Obadiah owned a successful cotton plantation consisting of 42 slaves and several hundred acres in Wilcox County, Alabama, in the heart of the Black Belt, a region named after its dark, fertile soil. But it was also infamous for its brutal working conditions. Now, this is the last will and testament of Obadiah Dumas. It was recorded in 1834. I will to my beloved wife, Mary Dumas, mm -hmm. during her natural life or widowhood, 15 Negroes, mm -hmm. say Tony and Clara, his wife. Amazing thing about this will, Tom, is that the slave owner, Obadiah, refers to Tony and Clara as husband, husband and, and wife. wife. Black people had their own marriages, but no, a white man wasn't bound to respect that. So people would say, you can't sell them. That's my husband. And they say, you know, you're black, you can't be married. But this man, Obadiah, recognized their marriage. Obadiah was a good slave owner. He was a good slave owner. As, if, slave, owners, as slave owners go, he respected them as human beings. As human beings. When the law... Didn't. Didn't. Slave marriages injected into this otherwise very unstable system a degree of coherency, a degree of stability. It was also a way of, you know, in saying, I have a family. They were giving the lie to slaveholders' ideology. They were, in fact, as human as anybody else. For Kathleen Henderson's great-great-grandparents, Dennis and Julia Jackson, a Civil War pension application revealed that their marriage vows went far beyond the traditional jumping the broom ceremony that constituted so many slave weddings. Dennis and Jackson Julia Nee Mason were married about the year 1864 by Reverend George Downey in Fayette County, Kentucky. And then one more interesting piece, as if this hasn't been enough, the wedding took place in the home of a white man. Just goes to show mm -hmm. that all people are not alike. We've got this concept that slaves jumped the broom, yes. and that signified marriage. Well. The record there says, no, there is a minister, and there was a ceremony, and ain't no recording of a broom. <laughs> brooms not mentioned. <laughs> no brooms mentioned. No matter how hard they tried to protect these relationships, their families were always vulnerable. One of the most dangerous times for any slave was the death of his or her master. All of his property was passed on to his heirs. And slaves, first and last, were property, not family. 
Linda Johnson Rice's great-grandfather was William McAlpine. When his owner, Robert McAlpine, died in 1855, his will ordered that all of his slaves be sold, including eight-year-old William. We searched for clues to tell us the names of William's relatives and whether his family survived the auction block. The following is an inventory and appraisement of the estate of Robert McAlpine, late of Coosa County. Bill, a boy, $450. So that's your great-grandfather, William McAlpine. Right. Do you see anyone who could have been his mother? Well, I guess it could have been one of these two women. Emily, a woman, at $700 value. Mm -hmm. And Park, a woman, $700. Right. So Park or Emily. But there was no way to know for sure. But most likely, one of these two women was Bill's mother. It was Bill's mother, yeah. The next record we found is dated October 1855. The heirs of Robert McAlpine were purchasing items from his estate. Do you see your ancestor? Absolutely. Boy, William, $505. Emily, the woman we thought might have been William's mother, is purchased by another McAlpine heir. And Park, remember the other possibility? Right has disappeared by this time altogether. So he's, so William is without mother at all? William's without mother at all. Okay. The person that you love the most that has nurtured you all of your life, which is a short eight years, is torn from you. And I'm sure that it was not without a lot of physical and emotional grief and pain. Mm. Um, the Loneliness was probably almost unbearable on both sides. Absolutely. Tough. Very tough. We all know, uh, when we read African American history, but we all know that families were separated. Um, but it's very rare for us to be able to... to... Excuse me. It's hard. I can only, um, you know, imagine being separated from my daughter. It's just hard, hard to imagine. This is your life. This was enforced orphanage mm -hmm. through the marketplace. Just, I mean, the people just had no sympathy for family bonds because no. we were animals. No. no, we were, you know, we we're your property and. Um, and to be that callous about a human life is just, um, it's unforgivable almost. Although the auction block tore families apart, we discovered a rare firsthand account that proves that orphan slave children vividly remembered their absent loved ones. We searched every possible record in Mississippi for mention of your great grandmother, Cindy Anderson. Mm -hmm. And we found an incredible document, my good brother. Uh -oh. And for all the people I've done, we've never found a document like this. In the 1930s and 1940s, the federal government uh, sponsored a federal writers project. Okay. And one of the things that the federal writers project did was to send workers throughout the South interviewing former slaves. Can you see the name of the former slave who was interviewed? Cindy Anderson, Charleston, Mississippi. My master was Mr. Herb Kane. Old Mr. Kane bought my father and mother in North Carolina when they was little children. But after I was born, he sold my father to a man named Colonel Wright. It was nine years after Reb time before I ever seed my father again. You're the only person I know who can reach out and touch a remnant of their family's history in slavery. And Recite it out loud. I mean, you have a testimony from an actual slave. I have it right here. Yeah, right here. That's, that's her. Those are her words. And that's your family. Yeah. Small farmers like Cain owned a handful of slaves, and they struggled to stay out of debt, which frequently forced them to sell their slaves. Mm -hmm. Now, this appears to be what your great-grandmother Cindy describes in her slave narrative when she says that Cain sold her father because they were considered as property and not people. Not yeah. real human beings. Yeah, I'm not even treated as well as a mule.
These stories of sale and separation poignantly illustrate how our ancestors were at the mercy and whim of their owner's economic desires. Jackie Joyner Kersey's fourth great grandfather was a man named Gabriel Connor. We located a deed dated 1827 from Culpeper County, Virginia. It tells the story of a long forgotten journey that separated Gabriel from his family. Whereas the said Francis Lewis Connor and Mary, his wife, are about to remove to Western County, said Lewis and Mary shall carry with them two slaves and a light wagon and three horses to wit a man by the name of Gabriel. A man <laughs> by the name of Gabriel. And mm. that Gabriel, Gabriel is your Gabriel, your fourth great grandfather. Can't believe it. Gabriel's journey couldn't have been more unlike the popular romantic image of pioneer life. After being separated from his family and his friends, he was marched 700 miles to western Tennessee. In this wilderness of pine trees and mud flats, Gabriel performed the backbreaking labor of turning the frontier into a cotton plantation. The circumstances of Gabriel and Francis is a, a common act which is played out literally thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of times in the South. If you want to uh, get rich uh, and if you're in the South, uh, uh, get yourself uh, some land uh, out in that rich soil of the Black Belt, take some labor out there. That's where opportunity was. Between 1810 and 1860, more than one million slaves were sold and shipped from the Upper South to the Deep South. White 19th century pioneers had become part of the myth of America. You know, Conestoga wagons, you know, going west, et cetera. But you never see in, in wagon train or one right. of those, you never see black people, right? No. You don't see their slaves trailing, trailing along. No. We'll never be able to restore our people's collective history right. until we restore the history of each family who make up our people. Right. I don't think people think about what this country's been built upon and who were able to do that, mm -hmm. manpower and the labor mm -hmm. that went into that. So um, even for myself, you know, it's just not something you, you, you think about. And, and it's sad. Mm. It's just uh, unbelievable. Masters could beat, violate, or humiliate their slaves with impunity. There wasn't even a law that prevented an owner from raping his female slaves. Most of these abuses were anonymous, left out of the public record. To uncover them, we have to turn to unofficial histories. Don Cheadle's cousin shared a family story about the sexual exploitation of their great-great-grandmother, Mary Cannoli. Your cousin told us that this family was owned by a white man in Alabama named Trawick. He also said that in 1853, Trawick fathered a child named Hester by your great-great-grandmother, Mary. Could this be true, we wondered. According to the 1860 slave schedule, George Trawick own slaves whose ages match exactly those of Mary, her husband, and their five children. If her master did, in fact, father Mary's daughter, Hester, then this schedule will contain a seven-year-old girl whose race is mixed. <laughs> 